21st of June, 1941, Moscow. An express train from Berlin arrived at the Bieloruski terminal. On board was Mikhail Vorontsov, naval attaché at the Soviet embassy in Berlin. He was taking no chances with his briefcase. Two days before, Vorontsov had received a high-priority telegram from Moscow, ordering his immediate return. An escort arrived to meet him on the platform. An official from the Commissariat of Foreign Affairs, accompanied by two officers of the NKVD secret police. A government car pulled up outside. Vorontsov was ushered onto the back seat between the two policemen. He could relax for the first time since leaving Berlin. His precious briefcase was now someone else's concern. Mikhail Alexandrovich Vorontsov fought with the Bolsheviks in the Russian Civil War before joining the Naval Academy. After graduation, he was sent to the Far East, where he rose to become Deputy Chief of Staff of the Pacific Fleet. In 1939, he was sent to Berlin as the Soviet Naval Attaché. The driver stopped outside the Spaskaya Tower, the entrance to the Kremlin. Ten minutes later, Mikhail Vorontsov entered Stalin's office. Amongst the documents he'd brought from Berlin was a copy of a message he'd been given by the Swedish naval attaché. The document was headed, Official Inquiry from Berlin regarding the routes of Swedish ships and aircraft in the Baltic Sea after the 22nd of June 1941, to avoid engaging them during war with the USSR. Soviet intelligence work was carried out both legally by agents traveling under Soviet passports and illegally by agents with forged documents. Foreign intelligence work was carried out by networks known as residencies. Each member of a residency, whether working legally or illegally, had a specialized role. One agent recruited and managed local agents. Another was responsible for radio communications. Another acted as courier of secret or stolen documents. And the resident himself oversaw all the group's operations. In the early 1920s, Soviet intelligence began to establish legal and illegal residencies across Europe. After 1933 and Hitler's rise to power in Germany, it became clear which country posed the greatest threat to the Soviet Union. Therefore, many Soviet agents were reassigned to Nazi Germany to gather information on the country's military potential and its intentions. After war broke out in 1939, the number of illegal Soviet residencies in Germany increased by 50%. Similar networks were active in Belgium, the UK, the Netherlands, Switzerland, France, Japan, Bulgaria, and Yugoslavia. Military intelligence residencies worked legally in many of the same countries. Each agent had a cover job at the Soviet embassy or with some other Soviet delegation. The agent might be a diplomatic official, a chauffeur, or a technical expert. In June 1941, the Military Intelligence Central Office employed 914 people abroad, 316 of whom worked as part of legal residencies and 598 of whom were illegal agents. 
Even Stalin knew most of these men only by their code names. He himself had enough experience of working in the underground to know that the more times an agent's name was mentioned, the greater the danger he faced. From the autumn of 1940, an increasing number of reports began to warn about the build-up of German forces along the Nazi-Soviet frontier in Poland. Soviet military intelligence desperately sought the answer to the questions, would Hitler attack, and, if so, when? The incoming reports offered many different dates for a German invasion of the USSR. Initially, it was supposed to take place in March or April 1941. Then new reports said it had been postponed to the summer, but depended on Britain's surrender. Then there was fresh information that it had been postponed until 1942. The situation was further complicated by the fact that only one person knew Hitler's exact intentions, Adolf Hitler himself. He only signed the order authorizing Operation Barbarossa, the invasion of the Soviet Union, on the 10th of June 1941, 12 days before it was launched. On the 18th of June, Moscow began to receive reports from agents on the frontier that German military units were preparing for something big. It was clearly no longer a matter of months or weeks, but of days. But despite the growing warnings, Soviet intelligence failed to produce anything, even Vorontsov's Swedish telegram, that could persuade Stalin that war was imminent. In just a few weeks, Vorontsov would be promoted to Chief of Staff of Naval Intelligence, and by September, he would be its commander. It was a job he would hold for more than 10 years, but he would inherit an intelligence service rendered blind and deaf by the sudden German invasion. Operation Barbarossa had begun, and despite all the warnings, the Soviet Union was not prepared. In the first days of the war, all Soviet legal residencies in Germany, in the countries of her allies, and in countries occupied by the Axis were terminated, and all embassy workers were deported back to the Soviet Union. Soviet military intelligence lost contact with its agents in 11 European countries. The agents themselves remained at large, but if they couldn't contact Moscow, they were of little use. A similar situation occurred with intelligence networks that had been established along the frontiers. As the German army swept forwards, contact with most of these agents was lost until the end of the war. Soviet agents working abroad did not have access to enough radio sets or skilled operators. The radio equipment they did have was bulky and unreliable. There was even a shortage of radio batteries. The range of these radio sets was no more than 600 miles, which meant their signal could only reach the Western Soviet Union. It wasn't strong enough to reach Moscow, let alone Koibyshev, where military intelligence headquarters had been moved to. The codes and encryption keys used by Soviet intelligence at the start of the war were complex and difficult to work with. It took a long time to encode and decode even the simplest message. Radio transmissions could also be picked up by German counterintelligence, who patrolled the cities with direction-finding equipment to locate illegal transmitters. Direction-finding used directional antennae to establish the source of a radio signal. By the mid-1930s, it was in use by most counterintelligence services. 
Three vans, equipped with mobile directional antennae, would patrol a city looking for unusual radio transmissions. They would triangulate their findings to pinpoint the exact location of the radio transmitter. Once the exact building was identified, police units would surround it, force their way in, and arrest the operator. German counter-espionage made it almost impossible for Soviet agents to communicate directly with Moscow. Communication with most Soviet pre-war agents was only re-established in 1945, as the Red Army advanced into Eastern Europe. Improvised lines of communication, often using couriers, were used to deliver the most important information. But while couriers could move across Europe with ease in peacetime, during the war it was a different matter. They not only ran the risk of being arrested by the Gestapo, but also of being killed in attacks on ships, trains and roads. In Japan and China, Soviet agents remained active. A few illegal residencies continued to operate in occupied France, Belgium and Holland. Soviet intelligence remained highly effective in the USA, the UK and in neutral Sweden and Switzerland. July 1941, Stockholm. Three weeks into the German-Soviet war. From the outside, the fish warehouse near the docks of the Swedish capital looked like any other building in the area. But this one harbored a secret. It was the home of the code and cipher department of the general staff of the Swedish armed forces. Alain Nieblad, a Swedish war ministry courier, was considered a master of his trade. The general staff trusted him with their most urgent and important papers. He was a stickler for the rules and would only ever hand his package to the exact person to whom it was addressed. It annoyed a lot of people, but the war minister was impressed by his punctilious courier. What none of the Swedish authorities knew was that Nieblad was a secret communist and Soviet agent. To make it easier for the couriers to get around town, their bicycles carried special license plates. This meant they wouldn't be stopped by the local police. One day, after receiving a package addressed to the general staff, Alan Nieblad set off on his bike through the quiet Stockholm streets, but then took an unexpected turn down a deserted alley and dismounted. After checking the coast was clear, he took off his special license plate and replaced it with an ordinary one. He arrived at a two-story house and went in. Come in. Semyon Storistin worked officially for a Russian tourist agency. He also worked for Soviet military intelligence. Semyon Kuzmich Storistin, codenamed Kent, joined Soviet military intelligence in 1937 and was sent to Scandinavia in 1939. His cover story included a job as director of the Russian tourist agency In Tourist in Sweden, Norway and Denmark, as well as a representative of Aeroflot, the Soviet state airline. In November 1941, he returned to the USSR when one of his agents was captured.
When all the documents had been photographed, Storistin put the papers in a new envelope. Rubber stamps from numerous Swedish institutions were at his disposal. The value of this intelligence was enormous. Thanks to Kent, Moscow received daily reports on enemy movements along the entire Eastern Front, because the Swedes were listening in on the Germans and had broken their codes. In 1940, Sweden had suspected Germany of planning to occupy the country. Stockholm set out to uncover Hitler's intentions. Swedish maths professor Arne Berling, working alone with just pad and pencil, was able to crack German military and diplomatic ciphers in just two weeks. It allowed the Swedes to intercept and decode German cable traffic. And what the Swedes saw now also went to Moscow. In January 1942, Nieblad was picked up by the Swedes and sentenced to 12 years hard labor. But by then, Moscow had information on how the Swedes had broken the German encryption. In June, when the Germans were tipped off that the Swedes were listening in, Soviet cryptographers were able to decipher the new German codes themselves. The 18th of October, 1941. Tokyo. The Japanese Empire and the Soviet Union observed an uneasy peace, but tension remained high. At dawn, Japanese counter-espionage launched an operation to smash an illegal Soviet spy network. One of the men they arrested that morning was Richard Zorge, the group's resident. As he was led away under heavy guard, a thorough search was made of his flat. The Japanese found incriminating documents, cameras, and a photostat copying machine. When they searched the house of Max Clausen, the group's radio operator, they found his transmitter and his code books. Richard Zorge, also known by codenames Sonter, Schwarz, Ramsey, and Insen, was born in Tsarist Russia, but as a boy moved with his family to Germany. After fighting for Germany in the First World War, Zorge became an ardent communist and moved to Moscow. There, he was recruited by Soviet military intelligence and sent back to Germany to build a cover story as a journalist and Nazi sympathizer. It served him well until October 1941, when he was arrested by the Japanese. They hanged him three years later. In 1964, he was posthumously awarded the state's highest award, the title Hero of the Soviet Union. Sorge's network included 32 Japanese agents, four Germans, two Yugoslavians, and one Briton. They included German radio operator Bruno Wendt, and his successor, Max Clausen, Manchester Guardian journalist Gunter Stein, Yugoslavian journalist Branko Vukelic, Japanese journalist Miyagi Yotoku, and Japanese journalist Hotsumi Ozaki, an advisor to the Japanese Prime Minister. Another valuable source for the group was Eugen Ott, German ambassador to Japan and confidant of Richard Zorge. Sorge's arrest and the dismantling of his Tokyo network was a bitter blow to Soviet intelligence. He had been an invaluable source on Japanese and German intentions in the Far East. Sorge's greatest coup had been to establish that Japan did not intend to attack the Soviet Union in 1941, as Stalin feared. He sent a telegram from Tokyo in September. According to the secretary of the cabinet, Ozaki, the Japanese government has decided to take no action against the USSR this year. But armed forces will remain stationed in Manchuria for a possible attack next spring if the USSR is defeated by Germany. After the 15th of September, the Soviet Far East can be considered safe from the threat of a Japanese attack. 
This vital information came as the Germans made their final push on Moscow. It allowed the Stavka High Command to rush 32 divisions from Siberia and the Far East to help defend the capital. On the 5th of December 1941, these divisions spearheaded a massive counterattack that threw the Germans back from the gates of Moscow. It was a crucial victory, which owed much to Richard Zorge. Soviet military intelligence also had its eyes and ears in Washington. From there, too, news reached Moscow about Japanese intentions in 1941. Lev Sergeyev worked at the Soviet embassy as the military attaché's driver. He was also an intelligence agent, codenamed Morris. All that summer, he sent messages to Moscow stating that Japan had no plans to attack the USSR. 16th of July, 1941, Morris to Moscow. The attitude of Japan towards the USSR is wait and observe. February 1942, Berlin. The head of the German military intelligence service, the Abwehr, was a man named Admiral Wilhelm Canaris. That spring, he was in low spirits. Hitler blamed Canaris for not providing accurate information on the size of Soviet reserves and for allowing the Wehrmacht to be caught off guard by the Soviet counterattack that winter. This, and the weather, was how the German generals explained their failure. Admiral Wilhelm Canaris became head of the Abwehr in 1933. He was a dedicated anti-communist which is why he initially gave his support to Hitler and the Nazis. But by 1938, he'd become convinced that Hitler would lead Germany to ruin. He began to actively conspire against the Fuhrer and in 1942 established a secret line of communication to British intelligence. The SS had its suspicions about Canaris and he was dismissed from his post in February 1944. He was arrested following the July bomb plot against Hitler and hanged in a concentration camp one month before the end of the war. As an anti-communist, Canaris still had a vested interest in the war against the Soviet Union. But the Abwehr failed to provide the Army High Command with an accurate estimate of Soviet military strength in the run-up to the German invasion. They also failed to place any agents within the Soviet High Command. The NKVD was extremely adept at exposing enemy agents. Numerous Soviet prisoners of war were recruited as spies by the Abwehr and smuggled back across the lines. But almost all of them disappeared into the vast Russian hinterland. Some turned themselves in, some were picked up by the NKVD, others simply went home. Very few of these agents made it back and their reports contained little of value. Canaris's mood improved in December 1941 when he received an unexpected report from the intelligence chief of Army Group Center. There exists in Moscow an underground anti-Soviet organization called The Throne. It is attempting to spread anti-Soviet feeling amongst the people. The leaders are Sadovsky, a royalist and poet, and his wife, a former lady-in-waiting to the Tsarina. One of its members, Demyanov, the grandson of a Cossack chief and former noble, risked his life crossing the front line to tell us about the existence of the throne. During his interrogation, Demyanov claimed to have been in contact with German intelligence since 1940. His contact had been a man named Stotz. After his story was rigorously vetted, Demyanov was given a code name, Max, and sent back to the Soviet Union. Max's mission was to organize underground anti-Soviet cells in major cities, to orchestrate a campaign of sabotage, and to establish a network for gathering information about the movement of Red Army forces. Most importantly, Max was to use his contacts in the Soviet General Staff and the Ministry of Transport to find out about military movements by rail. 
At the end of the war, Richard Cowder, an officer of the Abwehr, was captured by the Americans. During one of his interrogations, he told them that in 1942 and 43, Max supplied valuable information that was often passed on to the Wehrmacht High Command. The Germans believed that Demyanov had infiltrated the Soviet general staff as a junior signals officer. Kauder further claimed that the throne had set up several cells in Moscow and Gorky, which communicated directly with the Abwehr in Berlin. They did this using three transmitters supplied to them by the Germans. And all of this, it seemed, under the noses of the famed Soviet counter-espionage services. The Germans did not discover until after the war that this underground anti-Soviet organization had been created by the NKVD. Soviet intelligence had meticulously created plausible anti-Soviet agents, which they then used to infiltrate the Abwehr. These agents then fed the enemy misinformation. It was called Operation Monastery. Since the 1930s, the poet Boris Sadovsky had been used by the NKVD as bait to trick opponents of the regime into revealing their anti-Soviet sentiments. On three occasions, the secret police had arrested his associates, but the poet himself always remained free. Alexander Demyanov was a former noble who became an NKVD agent in 1929. He infiltrated German intelligence in 1942 and even received specialist training from the Abwehr. He was later awarded the Order of the Red Star for his exceptional service in Operation Monastery. Meanwhile, German intelligence continued its attempts to recruit Soviet prisoners of war. From the spring of 1942, Canaris' agents brought him regular reports about the progress made with former soldiers of the Red Army. German intelligence was well-versed in techniques for turning Soviet citizens against Stalin and Soviet communism. The Admiral hoped that these recruits would provide valuable intelligence, but he would be disappointed once again. October 1942, Poltava occupied Ukraine. At the intelligence school of Abwehr Group 102, former Soviet soldiers were listening to a lecture on how to gather military secrets whilst operating behind enemy lines. The door opened and the head of the school walked in. What no one in the Abwehr knew was that Pyotr Priadko, former depot commander of the Soviet 5th Army, had infiltrated German military intelligence under the orders of the NKVD. All the information he was giving them was in fact misinformation, prepared in Moscow. Priatko's role in Abwehr Group 102 was to forge papers for the students. He always made small mistakes that would ensure the agent was arrested when his papers were properly examined. His misinformation also succeeded in compromising several high-ranking German intelligence officers who were dismissed from their posts. Priadko sent back information on 101 agents working for the Germans and 24 members of the Abwehr. In December 1942, he rejoined the Red Army. He was subsequently awarded the Order of the Red Banner for his courage and heroism. 
Over the course of the war, the Abwehr was infiltrated by hundreds of Soviet agents. They gathered information about the enemy and planted false information about the Red Army and its intentions. They had effectively succeeded in turning Germany's own intelligence services into its high command's biggest source of enemy misinformation. Thirteenth of September, 1943, Paris. A car carrying two passengers drove up to a pharmacist's shop on Rome Street. One man left the car and went in. After a few moments, the other man went in too. The man on the run was Leopold Trepper, a Soviet agent who'd agreed to work for the Germans two weeks before. But now he'd given his Abwehr handlers the slip. The furious Germans launched a city-wide manhunt. As early as 1938, Trepper had established a powerful Soviet intelligence network across Belgium, the Netherlands, France and Italy. It had about 300 members, and Trepper was its head until his arrest by the Abwehr in November 1942. Through his group, the Soviets also received intelligence from Rudolf Rösler. Rudolf Rösler, codenamed Lucy, was one of the most valuable agents of the Second World War. A German refugee living in Switzerland, he began working for Soviet intelligence for ideological reasons. He supplied the Soviets with vital information about the German Kursk Offensive of 1943. Rösler's own source, codenamed Werther, remains a mystery. At the Nuremberg trials, Alfred Jodl of the German Armed Forces High Command said that information about the Kursk offensive reached Moscow before it reached his own desk. After the war, Rosler continued to feed the USSR information gathered in West Germany, leading to his arrest and a year in a Swiss prison. He died soon after his release in 1958. After Trepper's arrest, German counterintelligence succeeded in shutting down most of his networks. In Berlin, they referred to Soviet radio operators as pianists. Trepper's network involved at least 10 pianists, hence the nickname, the Red Orchestra. German counterintelligence was able to force some of the Red Orchestra's former radio operators, including Trepper himself, to start feeding misinformation to Moscow. Admiral Canaris had made a breakthrough. The Soviets did not only believe the misinformation, they asked for more. After his escape, Trepper, with the help of French communists, managed to get word to Moscow that his network had been compromised. The information coming in from its former radio operators was finally seen for what it was. November 1944. Two Soviet agents were conducting round-the-clock surveillance on the Norwegian coast. Twelve-hour 
hours later, a staff officer entered the office of the Chief of Naval Intelligence, Mikhail Vorontsov. Срочно передайте координаты линкора британцам. The Tirpitz was one of the few remaining threats posed by the German Navy. She'd played little direct part in the war so far. But her presence in Norway threatened the Arctic convoys to the Soviet Union and tied down a significant number of British warships. The sister ship of the Bismarck, she might still prove a formidable adversary. On the 12th of November 1944, British Lancaster bombers, carrying five-ton tall boy bombs, set off for the Norwegian fjord of Tromsø. The Germans had no warning of the raid. The Luftwaffe was nowhere to be seen. Two of the huge bombs hit the port side of the Tirpitz, blowing a massive hole in the ship's hull. As water poured in, she took on a heavy list and capsized. The destruction of the Tirpitz at Tromsø cost the lives of 1,000 of her 1,700-man crew. It was a final nail in the coffin of Hitler's navy. Since the summer of 1941, the Soviets had had their spies in Norway, including units gathering intelligence for the Soviet Northern Fleet. They also recruited agents from the local population and worked with the Norwegian resistance. Some Norwegian agents were sent to a Soviet training camp near Murmansk, where they were given basic instruction in radio communications and intelligence gathering. The agents were then sent back to Norway by submarine. After nightfall, they would be landed on a secluded stretch of coastline. Groups would also be resupplied and finally extracted by submarine. The agents' orders were to observe German fortifications, troop movements and military supply depots. They were also ordered to find German warships hidden in the Norwegian fjords and transmit this information back to Murmansk. Soviet and British air forces were able to use this intelligence to make raids against valuable German targets in Norway and Finland. Following Germany's surrender in May 1945, for most, the celebrations could begin. But there was no let-up for the secret services. It was clear that in Washington and London, the rise of Soviet power aroused great mistrust. Mutual suspicion came to the fore. Now the common enemy had been defeated. In April 1945, the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill ordered his military staff to investigate the feasibility of an attack against the Soviet Union, codenamed Operation Unthinkable. The study was conducted by the British Armed Forces Joint Planning Staff. Their report envisaged a scenario in which 47 British and American divisions fighting alongside Polish forces and 12 rearmed German divisions launched a surprise attack against the Red Army in northwest Europe. The planning staff concluded that Britain would have to commit to a long and costly war, and that, even so, the prospect of success was extremely doubtful. In his comments on the plan, 
Churchill stated that it was a precautionary measure for a highly hypothetical situation. On the 18th of May, 1945, the Soviet military attaché in London, Major General Ivan Sklerov, passed information on the top-secret Operation Unthinkable to Moscow. Sklerov's source was an Agent X, whose identity to this day remains a mystery. Over the next few weeks, this same agent was able to pass Sclair off more details about Operation Unthinkable, including the size of British and American forces involved. In June 1945, Marshal Zhukov received details of the plan and immediately regrouped Soviet forces in eastern Germany. He issued orders for the Red Army to strengthen its defences and to closely observe the Western Allied forces. Churchill knew British and American forces were outnumbered by the Red Army. More importantly, he knew that there was neither the public nor political will for such a war in 1945. The Americans were more interested in getting Soviet help in the war against Japan. Operation Unthinkable remained just that. In July 1945, during the Potsdam Conference, American President Harry Truman as agreed with the British Prime Minister, mentioned to Stalin that the US had developed a new weapon of unusually destructive force. Truman was surprised by the reaction of the Soviet leader. A few minutes later, as they waited for their cars, Churchill asked Truman how it had gone. He never asked a question, replied the President. The British and American leaders assumed simply that Stalin had failed to understand the significance of what he was being told. But they were mistaken. Since 1942, Soviet intelligence had been gathering information on the Allies' atomic bomb program. More than 10 agents were feeding information to the Soviets. Thanks to their efforts, the USSR tested its first atomic bomb as early as 1949. In February 1945, in a letter to Truman's predecessor, President Roosevelt, Josef Stalin had even hinted at the effectiveness of Soviet intelligence. As to my informers, I assure you they are all very honest and modest people who carry out their duties carefully and without giving offense. These people have proven themselves by their deeds many times. <laughs>